Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation uh, in virtual mode now since I guess the year dot. Um, we have been looking at many issues in the financial field and obviously the damage, if damage it is, that Brexit did to the City of London and that the pandemic may have done to the City of London is obviously a really important issue. A number of uh, independent agencies have had a look at the competitiveness of the City of London and indeed more broadly of the UK financial services sector and I'm delighted that uh, the progenitor, if that's the word, of one of the more important has agreed to come and talk us through what he found from the study that uh, New Financial did. William Wright is the founder and managing director of New Financial LLP. I note the LLP. Uh, New Financial puts it promotes itself as a city think tank. We're a charity, they're an LLP. That's the way it goes. If I, actually, if I was setting up the CSFI again, I would do it in a different way. Uh, but city, new, new Financial was set up in two, uh, 2014 to, and I quote, to make the positive case for the vital role that capital markets play in driving growth and prosperity. Uh, William has been around the city for many years. He was previously the editor of Financial News, uh, of which he was one of the launch team in 1996. He became the editor in 2004. He was educated as almost everyone in the city was at Oxford, but also at King's College London. Uh, in June 2021, uh, that's last month, uh, New Financial published its report, Driving Growth, the New Financial Global Financial Center, Center's Index. Uh, and it was, while it was written by Panas Asimakopoulos, uh, the head of research at New Financial, it was very much driven by what uh, William wanted, what, William, um, what William's agenda has been, which is very much to, to stay on touch of every, with stay on top of everything that's happening in the UK financial services scene. But he's not going to get things all his own way. Carol Lanoue <laughs> is the chief executive officer of SEPS, the Centre for European Policy Studies, which was founded as long ago as 1983. It's in Brussels. Uh, and he has been the CEO since 2003. Uh, SEPS is, and again I quote, Europe's leading independent European think tank. Uh, he is also an independent director of the group, Grupo BMA, which, is, uh, which runs the Madrid Stock Exchange uh, and many other things. He's the, uh, he's the general manager of the European Capital Markets Institute. He's the director of the European Credit Research Institute. Um, he has recently published on anti-money laundering in Europe, uh, and he's been a good friend of the CSFI for many years. Nicola Watkinson is the Managing Director for International Trade and Investment at the City UK, which is the umbrella body which promotes the City of London's financial services sector. She was formerly the General Manager for the Americas at the uh, Australian Trade and Investment Committee, and she was the Deputy Consul General for Australia in New York. She's worked uh, for the Australian government on a num in a number of countries. Uh, in, I, I've got down here, uh, Delhi, Frankfurt, um, I can't even remember, see what, Melbourne. <laughs> uh, she joined the City UK only in February. Um, so that's the, that's the running order. I'm going to ask uh, William if he'll explain what's in the report, what its conclusions were, why he wrote it, and what the methodology was, because I think it's really interesting. There are a number of uh, in, indices of, of competitiveness in the city, but I think this is a new one, and I think in many ways, it's really a very impressive piece of work. William, I give you, William Wright. Uh, well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the CSFI for the kind invitation to join this discussion on financial centres, the impact of Brexit, the impact of the COVID crisis, and whatever else comes up. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion with you and Carol and Nicola. Um, I just want to stress before we get going, uh, as Andrew said, I'm the Managing Director of New Financial. We make the case for bigger and better capital markets in Europe. Um, I'm absolutely not here to wave a flag for the City of London uh, or to wave a flag uh, for the industry itself. What I'm going to do today is very quickly zip through 
the main findings from the recent report that we published on global financial centers uh, and very much look forward to the discussion uh, in a few moments. So our starting point here was that Brexit and some of the bigger geopolitical shifts around the world over the past five, over the past few years have really, in our view, heightened the debate on the future of financial centers. So what we wanted to do was to produce an index that could complement the huge amount of excellent work uh, that has been done by others in this field. Our starting point for the index was that we think the best measure of the competitiveness or the attractiveness of a financial center is how much business firms choose to conduct in that financial center. And here are, fee, here are five key points about the ranking and the approach that we took. So firstly, our index is based entirely on quantitative measures across 42 different metrics of banking and financial markets activity, such as the value of the stock market, the value of FX trading, and so on. It's not based on qualitative measures such as the quality of infrastructure or education or regulation. The second key point in our, in our approach is that we distinguish between domestic activity, for example, the value of UK pensions assets or the value of French listed companies, and international activity, where firms have more choice as to where they locate that business, such as FX or derivatives trading or international IPOs. And we use 21 metrics for domestic activity and 21 for international. Third, we look at financial centers at a country level, not a city level, as we think it's pretty difficult to distinguish between IPO activity, for example, in London and IPO activity in Edinburgh. Uh, and fourth, the aim of our index, and I think what it does capture, is the relative scale of different financial centers. It doesn't just rank markets and financial centers, but shows the very clear differences in the scale of activity between them at both uh, a domestic and an international level at an overall level as well. As a small example, more people work in banking and finance in Canary Wharf in London than work in banking and finance in Frankfurt. And we think that that difference in scale is reflected in this report. The final introductory point, this, this approach enables us to measure the change in the value of activity over time in different financial centers. And it gives us a benchmark against which to measure future growth and future shifts in activity. We've tracked growth, for example, in all of these financial centers since 2016. We'll be able to track the actual impact of Brexit on the city of London uh, in future, or indeed for the potential impact of recent political issues in and around Hong Kong on its position as an international financial center. So let's start with the headline rankings. This chart shows the overall ranking of the top 15 financial centers in our report across all 42 metrics. In each metric, we allocated a value of 100 to the largest market by the value or scale of activity. And we rebased all of the other 60 countries uh, against that. Our overall ranking is a simple average of these scores. So this ranking shows that the US is by far the largest financial center in the world, perhaps not surprising, with a score of 84 out of a possible 100. Overall, the US score is more than double that of the UK in second place on 35. Now that's a much wider gap than in other surveys and other rankings, but we think it's perhaps more representative of the difference in the sheer scale of activity uh, between the US and the UK. You can see that China is in third place uh, with roughly, roughly half the size of, uh, so China is in third place uh, and Japan in fourth with a score of 19. And then it's followed by a cluster of smaller markets, Hong Kong, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Canada, and things drop away quite sharply after that. So this chart shows the top 15 financial centers based on domestic activity, the value of US listed companies, or UK pensions. This is much more a function of the size of the economy and the depth of the banking and finance sector, less about financial centers or international financial centers per se, 
because domestic business isn't really going to move from one country to another. You can see again that the US is on top here with 93 out of a possible 100. It's the biggest market in 17 of the 21 metrics that we looked at for, finan for domestic financial activity. It's roughly twice as large for domestic activity as second place China, which in turn is roughly twice as large as third place Japan. And it's interesting to note in domestic activity, the UK and France are roughly level and centers like Hong Kong and Singapore are much, much lower down the rankings. But I think when we think about financial centers, what we're really talking about is international financial activity. That is activity such as FX or derivatives trading where firms have a choice as to where they locate and conduct that business or activity like international IPOs where companies choose where to list outside of their domestic market. This chart shows the top 15 financial centers for international activity across these 21 metrics. The US is still top, it's still the largest uh, market for international activity in absolute terms, but its lead over the UK is much narrower. We've got Luxembourg and Hong Kong in third and fourth, and big European financial centers such as France and Germany, uh, much lower down, and roughly one fifth the overall value of international activity as in the UK. And I think what this underlines is that while the UK is relatively small as a domestic market, it has an outsize international market that is built on far more than just its European business. And I'm sure we'll come back to that in the discussion later. One benefit of our approach is that it enables us to measure how international a financial center is based on international activity as a percentage of total activity in those sectors where we can make that comparison. For example, international IPOs as a, total, as a percentage of all IPO activity or FX, FX trading conducted in a country that doesn't involve the local currency as a percentage of all FX trading conducted in that market. And what you can see here is that there's a clear group of four or five financial centers where a huge proportion of business being done every day is international. Roughly half of all business in the UK and Hong Kong is international and around 60% of business in Luxembourg and Singapore is international. But if you look towards the bottom of this chart, what you can see is that while the US is, much, is the biggest international financial center in terms of activity, it's much less international than other big financial centers with only 14% uh, of business in the metrics that we were able to compare being international. In Japan, it's just 7% and in China, just 3%. As one small example, we looked at foreign exchange trading and more than 80% of FX trading that takes place in the UK doesn't involve sterling. In France, around 40% of a much smaller overall volume of FX trading doesn't involve the euro. But in the US, just 11% of FX trading doesn't involve the US dollar. I mentioned earlier um, that our approach enables us to measure the change in activity between different financial centers over time. This chart shows the average percentage change in the value of domestic activity in the top 10 financial centers and a selection of others. The periods that we compared here were the three years to 2019 compared with the three years to the end of 2016. And over that period, what you can see is that global domestic activity increased by around 60%. Got very fast growth for Singapore, France, China, not so much for Hong Kong, UK, India, or Australia. It's fascinating to see in this domestic activity flatlined in the UK in the three years after the referendum. Perhaps that's the impact of the Brexit referendum and three years of uncertainty for the UK economy. And here's the same analysis, but for international activity. What you can see is the global growth on average in international activity of around 21%, very high growth in Hong Kong and Singapore of more than 50%. I'm not quite sure what's driving Canada. Uh, and it's interesting here to see the US and the UK growing slightly more slowly than the global average, which suggests that perhaps they're losing market share 
to Asian financial centers. The bigger concern here, I think, from a European perspective uh, is that EU growth uh, in international activity over this period was just 14%. Now that sounds good, but it's much, much slower, much lower than the global rate. And what that means is that the EU in international financial markets and international banking activity is losing market share uh, in global terms. Over time, it's shrinking uh, relative to other financial centers around the world. So look, that's a very brief uh, introduction uh, to help frame the discussion. Um, as I, I said, I look forward to the debate question. and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, you've just raised one thing. I mean, yeah. when you look at the Eurozone, centers in the Eurozone, you are defining all activity in Euros as being domestic, right? Uh, no, we're defining all activity, uh, all French activity as being French domestic, all German activity, German pensions, German. No, but no, if you uh, if you, you you were saying, I thought that in France, um, if activity was in the euro, um, that did not count as foreign exchange. Yeah, because the only way we could, sorry, in, in FX trading or derivatives trading, the only way we can measure the international nurse of trading activity in France uh, is to look at how much of it involves the local currency. So, right. yeah. But that, while the euro is the local currency, it is a far more international currency than the franc was. Yes. So it is actually discriminating, if you like, against eurozone countries that use the euro as their domestic currency. Would that be fair? In terms, it is understating the international aspect of their business. Um. I, I'm not sure it is, and 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 the the, the other issue is is when you look at the, I think you also have to look at it as I mentioned, um, in the context of the scale of activity. I mean, when we come to a, you know, we look at derivatives trading, uh, more than eighty percent of all derivatives trading that takes place uh, in the EU twenty eight takes place in the UK. So we may be discriminating against the international nurse of financial centers within the EU 27 or within the Eurozone, but it's very much at the margin, given how little activity in certain sectors takes place in those financial centers relative to the UK. Okay, two, two other questions. One, um, the cutoff date. Uh, you talk about 2019. Yeah. Uh, when, when was the uh, data actually compiled? So the data was compiled over the past 12 months. Um, we tried wherever possible to, co to create a consistent data set um, across as broad uh, a selection of markets as possible. And inevitably that introduces a time delay. So the latest available data across, we, we decided rather than, rather than using some data from 2020 where it's available um, and the rest from 2019, we decided to do a cutoff for all data as of the end of 2019. What, so what does this say about the pandemic? I mean, is this is... Um... It's too early, I think, in here to capture the impact of the pandemic because the data set stops um, at, at the end of 2019. It's also too early to capture, I think, the impact of Brexit. Uh, what it does you know, in certain sectors we know that Brexit will already have dented the UK's lead uh, in activity. So for example, one of the international metrics is foreign equity trading. We know that a large chunk of that has left because EU or trading in EU equities is now predominantly relocated from the UK to Amsterdam and to a lesser extent Paris. We know that some derivatives trading has relocated. Um, so yeah, there is always a trade-off in this sort of report in, in terms of trying to be as up-to-date as possible and trying to be as consistent as possible. That's, we, uh, but you know, that, um, that is something that um, obviously you will have to update because post-2019, what you're giving us really is sort of anecdotage uh, rather than hard data. Yeah, and, and one of the points, that, that, just to, to, to stress, in, in virtually all of our research, we use a rolling three-year average anyway to try and smooth out some of the volatility 
um, the annual volatility in different sectors of capital markets. Um, so it would take you know, a few years for the full impact of Brexit to, um, to, 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 to feed through into this report when we update it. The, the next likely update is going to be in 2022, maybe 2023, where we again will have a consistent data set. So we're able to compare, we would prefer to compare on the basis of official numbers rather than on the basis of anecdote. All right. At the, pre at the present time, you're, you're making a clear distinction between China and Hong Kong. If you were doing this now, would you actually incorporate Hong Kong into the Chinese data? Because China's position then would look very different. Um, that's an excellent question. I, I think you know, for the time being, we, we deliberately make that distinction because Hong Kong is very much the, I mean, it shines through from, from, uh, from these numbers, that Hong Kong is effectively the international arm or the international financial center for mainland China. Um, you know, 60, you know, 50 to 60% of business conducted in Hong Kong is international in nature, and just 3% of business in China is international in nature. Um, I think we will probably wait and see what happens politically uh, in Hong Kong and China in the next few years before deciding whether to bundle the two together. And of course, I mean, the international portion of Chinese China, of Hong Kong's business is largely mainland China. A huge chunk of it is Chinese, uh, is Chinese companies listing, you know, Chinese companies and Chinese activity sort of offshore Chinese activity, yes. Okay, well, look, let me ask uh, Carol, how, do you do you recognize the picture of, uh, of the UK's financial services sector here and also it's, you know, how, it, how it stacks up against continental European centers? Carol, the new. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, uh, William, for this interesting overview. Um, yes, to some degree, I understand or I see the EU versus the UK, but um, I thought the proportions for the UK were bigger overall, let's say the way I perceive it from, from Europe, let's say, than is um, coming out from your study, which I think, I mean, a big issue if you do this kind of metrics is the weightings which you give to certain elements. And of course, if you look at, for example, sizes of balance sheets, uh, for example, from banks, uh, trading activities, etc. We see that this, I mean, all these things and the weighting that you give, all these things will uh, impact uh, the size of what you have. To me, let's say we're working on a study at the moment on, for example, this whole debate about uh, equivalence and clearing and clearing certainly of um, under EMIR of derivatives, of OTC derivatives. I mean, and of course, in some of your rankings, this come out, uh, comes out, London is basically of course, a bit smaller than the US, but London is undisputed, let's say, the second most important financial center in the world. And it's so international, much more international than, for example, Hong Kong is or uh, Tokyo is. So, and that I don't see so much in your studies. But again, that depends on what you look at. And of course, there is a distinction, as you said very rightly, between domestic and then the international activity. And of course, every financial center, like, for example, Paris, is domestically very important but it's internationally much less important and for, has lost a lot of market share internationally. Take Luxembourg, on the other hand, is domestically, I mean, I mean, can be neglected, but is internationally very important. So that's why it is difficult to make, let's say, these kind of uh, comparisons. And I've struggled with this as well, if you speak about financial centers, but I mostly look at cities or at places rather than at countries, because it's so difficult because of that distinction between domestic and international. And also, if you do, I think, certainly for London, if you put it together, you do not sufficiently emphasize the value of the international activity in London. If you look, for example, at interest rate derivatives, how important they are for the, for the UK, for London, and how important they are also, they just demonstrate so well how international the role of the city is. There is only 25% of that, that activity, which is, basically in the hands of EU27 banks. For the rest, it's international. But the dominance of London in that business for interest rate swaps is about 90% of the global business is in London. And that I don't see so well. So London in certain elements is so dominant, which will continue to be, and for my part, has not been that much affected by, uh, by Brexit so far. And that's why these equivalence decisions are so important. 
whereas the domestic activity may be impacted, but domestic activity is impacted by the pandemic, but also by, I mean, Brexit and my reduced economic prospects. But that will not so much affect London. And that's why, let's say, I would rather take uh, cities rather than countries, because London is a city on its own, as everybody knows, let's say, in its international activity. And there is the rest of the UK economy. And, and that's why I would keep it distinguished, because there's something unique in financial centers like in, in the US or let's say in, in Wall Street as well as, as London is in the amount of international activity which they can get. And that's what I probably don't sufficiently see. Of course, if you then compare to another country, which is uh, Switzerland, there it's difficult to say, is it Zurich or is it Geneva? And in Switzerland, you would take it together like you do in Luxembourg. But Luxembourg is a, is a special case, I would say. Or probably Hong Kong yeah, is then another uh, case on its own. But um, I think there are only basically for my part certainly if you look at uh, more sophisticated forms of finance two very large financial centers in the world and it's london and uh, wall street okay uh, your response to that first of all william I'll, you 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 made quite a thing about taking countries rather than cities do you accept uh, carol's point yeah i can I, I can see the the obviously when it comes to the international metrics what we're basically talking about is london paris frankfurt new york um it, it it gets more difficult in some of those sectors for example assets under management which is one of our metrics where asset managers largely have a choice as to where they locate the actual management function of the money they run um and you get into the danger, uh, you, you, you mentioned the, 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 the issue of weightings. Once you start separating out activity between cities, you're getting into the same danger, which is you're having to make often judgment calls as to how much of this activity should I allocate to London and how much should I, act to, uh, should I allocate to Edinburgh? How much venture capital activity in Germany should I allocate to Frankfurt? And how much should I allocate to Munich? Yeah. So we think a safer, uh, you know, we take almost as a given that actually when we're talking about international financial centers with one or two exceptions, like Geneva and Zurich, we're basically talking about a city. Um, and when we're talking about domestic activity, you're talking about across the entire country. Mm -hmm. Just a, a quick point on, on the weightings. We deliberately don't apply weightings. We don't say this, uh, this activity is more important, so we're going to give it 20%, and this one's less important, so we're only going to weight it by 10%. Um, and we, we make no apologies that, it, yes, it's a simplistic analysis, but we're deliberately trying to aggregate and compare sectors of vastly different value of activity with each other. Um, and you're right, Carol, on, in certain sectors, this, the headline index does underplay London's dominance. London's, London is the, or the UK in our, in our index, is the largest center for international activity globally in six different sectors. And they're all around foreign exchange and derivatives trading. And in the sort of, in the guts of the report, the detail of the report, what, what you can see is the relative scale of activity in London compared to other financial centers. Can I say though, that if you don't weight individual uh, separately weight individual activities, then you are weighting them all equally, despite the fact that they may employ very, very different numbers of people, despite the fact they may have much, very much different economic impact. So that's a, that's a fairly important decision you've made. I mean, it's a judgment call. It, it, it is a, it's a judgment call uh, at the very top of the process, which inevitably has an impact on the relative weightings what we do to try to get around that is that we, sub we, we separately group different metrics into fields of activity, um, you know, common fields of activity, for example, trading. Um, and, and from that, you can then, you know, we create a sort of separate index, if you will, for each of those groups of activity. Um, mm -hmm. So you can actually then compare at a more granular level mm -hmm. the, the relative scale of activity in different markets. If you were to try and weight weight them by value, what, what would be the metric that you would prefer to use? Would it be the, the dollar value of the activities? And if so, would it be net or gross? Would it be the employment generated by it? Would it be the tax take? I mean, have you thought, thought about some of those issues? One of the reasons we choose not to wait is we have asked ourselves those three questions exactly. Um, 
and it's very difficult to disaggregate um, you know, how many of you. We know, for example, that roughly 1.1 million people in the UK work in financial services. Roughly three to 400,000 work in what we would perhaps call the city. How do you, but I, I'm, I'm unaware of any reliable, consistent data source that tells us how many people working in the city work in these different sectors of activity. We would end up relying uh, on the individual uh, research or the individual contributions of sector trade bodies, which will be using different methodologies between different sectors. It's very difficult to disaggregate the, the, the tax take and indeed the revenue generated by those firms by that activity. I mean, you could say roughly 75% of an investment bank's revenue comes from sales and trading and roughly two thirds of that is fixed income currencies, roughly a third of that is, is equity. But you're having to make some pretty big guesstimations to get to any sensible weighting. So okay, we think well, it's safer let's... just to, to not wait. Let's bring in Nicola. Nicola, what's what's your thinking about this? Is is this a a useful exercise? Is it um, is it is or is it potentially misleading? What's what's the the city UK's view and also your own your own personal view on this? Nicola. Well, thanks, Andrew, and and I um I, and I'm delighted to be here because uh, I have to say, as you mentioned, I've come in relatively recently into the role of head of international at the city UK. And uh, I basically came on board to really look at how the UK can defend and grow its position as an international financial centre over the next five to 10 years. So when I saw this uh, benchmarking report from uh, New Financial, I thought, this is fabulous. It's going to give me some really good data to start working off. Uh, so I'm very grateful to William and his team for the work that they've done here. And, um, and when I looked at it, I think there's, there's probably a few things uh, that, I, I, that I immediately caught my eye. I think the, the first is to say, you know, that, we're, that the UK is in a pretty strong position, as, as Carol also said. If you look at it, the, the headline numbers are, are pretty good. And if you were getting this as a report card for today, you would be feeling, feeling pretty happy. Um, the number two position, as you say, has, has been very much uh, assured and it shows that the success of the UK is built on more than just uh, EU um, business. It has a very strong global uh, business and that's going to be really important as the UK really looks at how it positions itself into the future in a post-Brexit environment. So lots to be happy about. Um, but it does also have some cautionary um, moments in this report as well, which I think is also very important to highlight. Um, we do see also, of course, we've seen the domestic stagnation that uh, was, was pretty plain to see in some of the figures, particularly around uh, areas like FDI um, since 2016. So we can see that some of that uncertainty caused by Brexit really is already you know, visible in, in some of those figures. Um, and as William highlighted, there has been a bit of a dent in already from the figures up to 2019 in areas like foreign equity trade, which we sort of expected to see um, as one of the results of Brexit. But it is it is certainly visible. And as we look to the next report, it's certainly going to be one to watch. Um, so, so I think in terms of, you know, the headlines, it, it's been a really interesting tool and it does allow the UK to say if it does want to be, and, you know, my goal would be, you know, how does it become the number one global um, financial centre? What would it take to actually challenge uh, the US in terms of its credentials as an international financial centre? Because as one of the slides that William presented shows, the international part of the overall activity in the US is about 14%, whereas for the UK, it's, you know, it's much higher. So is there an opportunity in which the UK could become a, the number one leading international financial centre in the world? And what would it take to get there? I think that's, that's a really interesting question. And some of the things we see in William's um, report is giving us some clues 
in the challenges and the opportunities in that space. You really think it's it's uh, plausible? Is it is it realistic? Or would the Americans have to do something absolutely stupid, absolutely awful in order to drive the business offshore, as they've done in the past, I should add? Well, um, I'm, I'm happy to just, I'm happy to start, but I'd be really interested to hear from, from Carol and, and William as well, because I'm, I'm relatively you know, new in this space. But um, what are some of the things that really interested me um, in looking at you know, where might the UK be able to grow um, going forward? One was, I think, around uh, the point of FDI. Um, I think because of the uncertainty of Brexit, we, we did see a big stalling. Uh, the question is, could um, the UK start to attract more FDI again on the back of some of the new services and new offerings that it's going to be uh, creating? Is there an opportunity for it to export more to other parts of the world? So again, you know, there was a a decline in the export of uh, financial services um, in the last in in the report, but could that be turned around? There seem to be really good opportunities for the UK to do a lot more focus on export of its expertise, whereas the U the US may not need to do so much of that, if you like, because it has such a strong market at home. And finally, if you look at that kind of forward leading area, um, I thought some of the ESG. Um, uh, metrics were quite interesting where I think, you know, we can see uh, the UK, I think, William, you might want to correct me, I think it was number six overall, uh, but the UK is making um, a huge commitment in this area and certainly aspires to be a leading centre for ESG. Um, what would it take for it to be able to start to catch up with some of those markets that are ahead of it, where um, some of the markets also in the EU, like Luxembourg, has done a really good job in some of this work. And as we change the metrics, because William, I think you said yourself, you know, some of the metrics in your report around ESG are a little bit narrow at the moment. Is there an opportunity where the UK might be able to do more? So I guess some of those forward-leaning areas, Andrew, might be, might be opportunities for the UK to grow into the future. Well, let me just ask you, I'd very much like to get William's view on ESG, but let me pick you up on FDI, foreign direct investment, or foreign investment, port portfolio investment. There is a huge controversy in the UK the, this week, if you like, about uh, selling off UK PLC. Uh, that all UK assets are considered undervalued. Um, Every American private equity firm is looking, its eyes are getting bigger and bigger and it's snapping up all sorts of uh, companies in this country. Is that what you mean? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think FDI will come in a whole range of different forms. It might be new businesses coming from overseas to establish in the UK to take advantage of the, the talent and the infrastructure and the expertise that it has in certain areas. Uh, but it also might be some M&A activity as you highlight. And I guess, you know, the, the question there will be, you know, why are these companies undervalued? And, um, and, and that's probably a bigger question, I think, at the moment uh, than the cause of this debate. Uh, but I think generally the, the, the view is that, um, and the economics show, that productive foreign direct investment is really good for the economy. It creates growth. It provides good regional um, opportunity and economic strength. Um, and to, to pick up on the point that we were talking about before, um, that Carol raised, is it just about London? No, I don't think it is just about London. You know, two thirds of the jobs in financial services in the UK are taking place outside of, uh, outside of London and 50% of exports um, in the financial services sector in the UK come from outside of London as well. So I think, um, you know, there is an opportunity for FDI and for our export, for our international focus, to benefit a lot more than just London, but to be a real part of um, powering regional growth. Okay, well, let me let me ask William to respond on, on ESG issues and perhaps also Carol as well. I mean, there is an aspiration of this government to make the UK the global centre of environmental, particularly environmental finance. Is that, uh, is that realistic? Is that something that you feel uh, you're going to pick up in your future work? But also, do, you know, do you see the trends up through 2019? Um, one of the challenges uh, with uh, ESG is, is the consistency of the data set. Um, and as, uh, as Nicholas said, you know, we, we were effectively forced into, um, 
into limiting the, the inclusion of ESG in this data because we're trying to look back uh, over, over six years on a rolling basis. But what's clear from this is that while London may have aspirations to be a global financial center, perhaps the European financial center for sustainable finance, it has quite a lot of catching up to do. If we look at domestic activity, uh, green bonds, sustainable bonds issued by UK companies, um, the, uh, the UK is around a quarter, around a quarter the size of activity in the French market. I mean, France has absolutely got a very clear lead in activity in green bonds, sustainable, uh, sustainable bonds. International activity, the UK is a long way behind, um, uh, a long way behind the US and other markets uh, in terms of uh, foreign issuers um, coming to the UK uh, to raise sustainable finance. There is an opportunity. There is an opportunity to create perhaps uh, uh, a separate taxonomy for sustainable finance that sits alongside the EU's taxonomy, where again, the EU has a very clear head start. And there is an opportunity to tap into London's role as shown on the trading side and on sort of international capital markets side to tap into London's traditional role as an international crossroads and a financial center for connecting firms around the world that want to issue uh, sustainable bonds or get involved in sustainable equity with international investors uh, who want to buy that sort of thing. Uh, but there's no doubt that there is, um, you know, we're starting, I wouldn't say one hand tied behind our backs, but we're, 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 we're starting from, uh, from quite a long way behind right now. And there's a lot of work to be done. Carol, is that uh, is would you share that that view? I mean, in in a way, I'm quite surprised because the government certainly pr this government certainly promotes itself as a as a world leader in environmental finance, even if it's been slow off off the mark with with both its own taxonomy and with green bonds. Yeah, we have uh, followed this as well. This debate on ESG and, for example, sustainable bonds or on the green bonds. And if you look at this, for example. Um, the two leading organizations, because the UK, uh, the EU two weeks ago also brought out its own standards for sustainable bonds, uh, for government bonds, but also for others. But the two leading organizations are ICMA and the Climate Bond Initiative, which are both based in the city. And Climate Bonds Initiative is basically a city grown organization just because there's so much bond markets activity in, uh, in London. I mean, it's certainly something you can do. But if you see in this domain, as compared to other domains, the UK, and we had it in a debate on that with CBI, for example, with, uh, say, the Climate Bonds Initiative, they are mirroring what the EU is doing on the taxonomy, mm -hmm. which for me leads me to think, but why not in other domains? Why is the e UK trying to distance themselves, certainly in the political discourse, from what the EU is doing? Because it's so clear that the growth opportunity for the UK and for London as a financial center remains primarily the EU. And if you have a political discourse, as we hear in the newspapers about, for example, Northern Ireland and so on, that uh, we are going apart from each other, it's certainly not good for the city. And that's certainly not good for the people working on technical files here, here in Brussels, like on, for example, these equivalence files. I mean, I raised this issue about, for example, why is it that we have more equivalence, for example, with Saudi Arabia or with China than with the UK? That doesn't make any sense. But if the political discourse, as we hear it these days, continues to be as it is, it will not improve. And we are working on that at the moment. And if I hear the people in the commission, how they think about this, they do everything to make sure that at least a part of, for example, the derivatives market will come to the EU 27. I think it's an illusion because to get this derivatives market, for example, or the, the Forex market, or even the asset management market to come to the EU 27, you need much more and you will not get it here. So it's in both interests to make sure that they are kind of going in the same direction, but I don't see it happening. And well, that's why you need to have these signs from both sides, but above all from the UK and above all from the uh, government in the UK. 
you, know, you, you I mean, you bundled a number of things in, in there, but can, can I really ask you to clarify, you are not telling me seriously that the UK, uh, sorry, the European Union is more closely aligned on regulatory issues with Saudi Arabia than it is with the UK. I mean, if I look at the equivalence table, that, I may be, it, you. that may be what the Commission would like to pretend. But the fact is that as of three months ago, we were identical. I mean, Saudi Arabia. Exactly, is but that's why you have to play this extremely carefully. And from Brussels, it's seen as the UK walked away. So the UK has to do whatever it can to stay very close. It's doing this in ESG. That I think is a really important. Not political, but it's not doing this on other dossiers. And in other dossiers, we see that the divergence is, is growing. So Brussels says, oh, there is more divergence, no needs or no possibility to have more equivalence. But if we see, we have, I think with the US, we have 21 different areas of equivalence. With the UK, we have only two. Yes, but again, is that the fault of the UK or is that the fault of the European Commission that sees a, a, a granting of equivalence to the UK as a, a, a competitive disadvantage to the EU, whereas the US has a lot more muscle than the UK does? Yeah, but that's uh, what we want Politics. to bring out in our study. I mean, we have, and that is a, a thing also common to William, we in the EU have focused on regional specialization. The regional specialization for the UK was, amongst others, a financial center. We are now trying to go back on that, which is not good for both sides. We try to make out, look, try to work closely together because it's in the interest of both. And it's not, let's say, that you will soon develop a sizable derivatives market in, in Europe because it depends on so many other elements than only regulation. You need to have the size, you need to have the players, you need to have the balance sheets, you need to have the law firms, et cetera. And that you will not do rapidly. It will take at least 10 or 15 years before you have it. If you now see that the equivalence decision for, for example, um, under EMIR for derivatives markets will expire in June next year, that is extremely soon. Hmm. I okay, might well, just let me, let me ask Nicola to pick up on that. Nicola. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Carol's made a really important point here because you know one of the things that we look at um, from, from the City UK perspective is, is the whole ecosystem, uh, because that's what allows you to be able to be genuinely um, competitive. And if you want to be a, an international financial centre, basically what you're trying to do is outcompete every other jurisdiction in the world. And the way you do that is be able to have a full service offering um, right across whether it's legal or accounting and you know, professional advisory groups, as well as, uh, if you like, the financial services um, area. And that's, I think, what makes um, the UK stand out together with uh, the US. If you look at that ecosystem slide that, you, that William has in the report, it really shows that that's one of the key strengths. So I um, absolutely agree that, that you know, looking at you know, where you're gonna compete into the future, you have to have that whole ecosystem if you really want to go after some of this global business. Um, and that's why I think I, I'm, I'm still you know, very optimistic about the opportunities that the UK has. Um, uh, and it's interesting to see now how other centres are trying to grow internationally. And I guess one of the questions I, I'd be interested to look at, because coming from Australia originally, I spend a lot of time looking at Asia, is, is looking at that huge growth that we see in the figures um, for both Hong Kong uh, and for Singapore. Um, and yet, um, William, I'd be interested in your views, but I don't see um, them having a, a full service offering. In, in those locations as yet. So a little bit as the way Carol was saying for some of the European centres, um, I'm not sure, even though there's very strong growth internationally um, within the Asia Pacific, whether they, how much of a contender they're likely to be for, if you like, for the US or, or for the UK. Well, I want to pick up, pick, pick, ask your, to, to pick up on two of the things that, that Carol said. First of all, he did say that the major market for the UK post-Brexit is still the European Union. Is that the position of the city UK? Is that the position of the city in general? Because I was always under the impression that we saw, as you just suggested, Asia as its fastest growing market and indeed perhaps its biggest market. And the second, he made the point that in the ESG area, we are mirroring um, mirroring EU legislation, whereas in other areas of financial services, even though we started identically, we're now diverging. Is that also your understanding of how the UK is, is trending? 
Yeah, look, I think there's, um, there's so, so let me deal with the first one. Yes, of course, the EU is a hugely important market for the UK and will remain so. And, you know, businesses want to continue that partnership. Um, I think we all know it's going to be a little bit of a rocky road, um, at least in the short term, as the ramifications for Brexit work through. Uh, and some of those implications, as Carol says, are taking place at the political level um, rather than at the, at the business level. So um, the businesses are well prepared. Um, I think they are going to hope that equivalence and these kind of issues are resolved, but they are going to work around them if they are not. Um, but to add to that, if you look at where the future growth is going to be, um, I think if you look at where new markets are going to be um, going to be opened up, that is going to be in locations like the, um, the Indo-Pacific. And, you know, we have seen that statement by the government about looking at where the global economic um, gravity is going to, and that is into, into the Asia-Pacific region. And all economies, um, but particularly the UK, is going to be looking to tap into some of that growth as well. And then, of course, there is the US, which is a hugely important partner for the UK as well. And so um, markets like Japan and the US, which are also enormously important partners today, will continue to be so tomorrow as well. So I think it's, um, it's a bit of a portfolio approach to where you're going to grow your markets. Uh, we just did a big um, consultation with our members and, and they would say Europe and is very important and continues to be very important. But we're also looking for new growth uh, and new higher returns in, in high growth markets. And um, some of those will be in um, the Indo-Pacific. Others might be into markets like India and into Africa as well. Um, and at the same time, we are going to certainly hold, um, hold a strong focus on the US and Japan particularly. Well, let me ask you, William, I mean, the same two questions. Is, is, do, you, do you accept Carol's point that uh, the EU will remain the major, the major market and the most important market for the European, the e UK's financial services sector, um, which I think is an important point. And on the ESG, is it, in your opinion, true that we are mirroring uh, European legislation, whereas in other areas we're diverging? So on the first point, I think Carol's absolutely right. I mean, you know, the, the, the EU is a very large market and it's a, even post Brexit, it's a very addressable market and it's sitting right on our doorstep. Um, and notwithstanding Brexit, and despite the fact that we've only got two, or the UK has only got two equivalence determinations from the EU, a very significant part, a very significant amount of EU business can still effectively be either done from London or accessed via London. So if you take a large investment bank, um, virtually every large international non-EU investment bank or asset management firm has their European, their regional, or even in some cases their international headquarters sitting in London. And what they've had to do over the past few years is move as many staff, assets, operations as they need to, to the EU, in order to continue to access EU customers and EU markets. But as a percentage of their headcount in London, it's still very small in most cases. I think I'm right in saying that only one bank, one uh, international bank that we identified as having moved its European headquarters from London to the EU, and that was Commonwealth Bank of Australia. So yeah, it's a huge addressable, it's a huge market. It's the dominant, the biggest single market for most uh, international financial services activity in the UK, uh, in, uh, in, in the city. And the other challenge, of course, is the, the growth markets. Yeah, I mean, we recognize, and our research, previous research has made this pretty clear that in the long run, the EU will shrink as a proportion of global capital markets and financial activity, not because it's you know, going backwards, simply because Asian markets, there are bigger, faster growing markets further afield. But the clue is in the further afield, they are not very addressable. They are much harder to service from the UK. And let's be honest, most UK firms that want to access or operate in Japan or China or Hong Kong or India are already doing so. So the potential net benefit of, a, of, of increasing ties 
uh, and relations with these markets uh, is perhaps not uh, not as big as one might uh, not as big as the headline numbers might suggest. On the ESG side, I think it's a really interesting point, Andrew. We are mirroring, but we're doing that in a lot of different areas. Firstly, de facto, we're we're mirroring mirroring everything because we transposed EU legislation into UK law before Brexit. But we're now in this slightly odd position that the EU and the UK in parallel are reviewing large chunks of their own rule books. And the starting point was the same. So yes, our starting point on ESG is the EU taxonomy, but we're going to develop our own tweaks at the edges to that. Our starting point for capital requirements for insurers solvency too. But we're, we're reviewing that, and so is the EU. We're reviewing MIFID too, so is the EU. So we end up with this sort of, inevitably, there's going to be divergence between the UK and the EU. In some sectors, that will be because the UK decides to go in a different direction. In others, it will just be the gradual revision, uh, rethinking on both sides at the same time of their existing rule books, the gradual evolution of the framework. So we could end up in this strange situation where we're sort of shadow boxing that both sides are reviewing the same thing at the same time, and we're both effectively diverging, but in the same direction. <laughs> but it's still divergence. <laughs> okay, we're running out of time. I'd just like um, each of our speakers to put him or herself three years into the future and look at London as an international financial center. Uh, I can't imagine that, uh, um, that I can't, can't imagine that Nicola is going to say anything that other than the, the city will do very, very well. But three years from now, what are the major challenges that it faces? Uh, and then Carol and then uh, William, the final say. So Nicola first. Yeah, thank you. Look, I, I am optimistic, but I, I uh, and I do think there is enormous potential for the UK to grow in areas of, of future economic growth, whether that be around fintech and financial innovation, whether it be around uh, some of the topics we talked about, like ESG. I think you know some of the work around global risk and the UK being a, an amazing centre for global risk, and the points that we've talked about about it being a gateway for international investment to come into the into the UK. Um, at the same time, I think there are some cautionary tones, um, and it, there's a, there's no opportunity to be complacent here because we are seeing that um, other markets, whether they be Asian markets like Singapore and, and Hong Kong, um, are continuing to grow really strongly. So as, um, as William said, it's not about the case that Europe or the UK is going backwards. It's just that there's more competition coming from new players into the market. So there's a lot that the UK really needs to do in order to protect and then grow its current position as an international financial centre. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we can't just sit, if you like, on our, on our laurels and, and bathe in all the glory of this, uh, of this current report. We need to be really looking at what we need to do to retain that competitive advantage and be able to capture the next wave of growth. Can we, can we maintain our competitive advantage, Carol, or will our friends across the, across the channel eat our lunch? I think it will certainly not be easy. I think the main challenge will be how the UK economy itself will develop. And we've seen these figures already about the impact of Brexit on certainly the export potential, but also the imports in, in the UK are, are difficult. But we also see the public finances of the uh, UK and, and somewhat troubled. So every financial center grows on the basis of a strong domestic economy. Of course, the large financial centers. So that is for me the main challenge. How will the UK economy perform? And again, it's too early to say, but we've seen many worrying signals. For me, the other big challenge is the UK political system. And what you have in the EU is there is a correction by the EU of, for example, what is going on in certain member states. I mean, enough examples uh, to give. In the UK, that is no longer the case. So what can be corrected by whatever internationally if the UK political system goes out of control? I don't know. And that is, for me, uh, the other big challenge. How will the political system evolve in the UK? Well, when you say 
um, the challenge of the political system, you mean the possible breakaway of breakup of the of the UK Union, right? And, and UK and, Union, but also how the Conservatives will develop. I mean, whether we continue to be uh, behave like uh, very populist policies, like we see in Hungary and, and Poland, for example, which we wouldn't expect from a country like the UK. Uh, William, the final word is with you. Um, I don't want to comment on a breakup of, uh, of of the union, but if that were to happen, then I think we would we'd, we'd probably have to include Scotland in our next ranking. And um, <laughs> uh, I think there would be quite a significant migration of uh, of international activity from from London um, uh, up the motorway, up the rail line to to, to Scotland. Look, I think up, it would up, up, way, rather than down from down from Edinburgh. Which you think it would go that way? Uh, I, I think I think it could because you you get if if it's a Bit of a distraction, but but if Scotland were to leave one union and join another, then it's a convenient place. Just, to, but that's a separate. That's a separate discussion. For joining the European Union, <laughs> I mean, it would be behind Albania for that. I'm I'm say I think it's a distraction to, to 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 it's a it's a big it's a significant issue. The 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 politics of all of this is a huge issue, which I'll come to in just a second. On the numbers side, look, fast forward three to five years, inevitably there will be a dent in the UK's international financial activity. Some of that is a mechanical binary impact of Brexit. Some of that business can no longer and therefore will no longer be done in the UK. It will migrate predominantly to the EU and some may, uh, some may spin off towards the US. But I think that the UK, if we, if we run these numbers, when we run these numbers in two or three, two or three years time, the UK will continue to be uh, the dominant international rest of world financial center in Europe. It may no longer, and it will be the biggest international financial center in Europe, but it may no longer be the biggest financial center for Europe because a lot of that activity, what we're seeing here is not, you know, yen dollar trading moving from London to Frankfurt. It's, it's, it's local regional activity moving from the UK to the EU. And a lot of that activity is going to be dispersed across four or five financial centers in the EU. Very briefly on the politics that, that, that Carol mentioned, I think this is going to be a fascinating challenge in the coming years. There is a duality about the city as a financial center. On the one hand, the government, all governments want banking finance to play a significant role in supporting a post-COVID recovery and with this government supporting leveling up. But that is a very different part of the industry to the hosting of a global financial center, which predominantly, not exclusively, sits down in Canary Wharf. That is a very, the, the activities that take place there are very different. They raise very different political questions. Bankers have not been the most popular uh, workers in, uh, in the UK uh, since the financial crisis. And I think balancing the politics of the one, on the one hand, needing domestic banking and finance in the UK to support a recovery and needing international banking and finance in the UK to continue to generate employment and very significant tax receipts and a positive balance of trade, juggling that is gonna to be tough in the coming years. On that um, equivocal note, can I thank all of our speakers, William Wright and uh, all his colleagues at New Financial, Carol Lanou from SEPS and Nicola Watkinson from the City UK, and of course, all of you for watching. Many thanks.